gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Craig Ogilvie, who is the Dean of the Graduate School at Montana State University. Uh, Craig came to Montana State from Iowa State University, where he was Assistant Dean of the Graduate College. Um, Craig is a physicist by training. This isn't uh, a conspiracy amongst physicists to get more physics into math, um, but really we're here to learn about some of the really important work Craig has been doing about the, the lives of graduate students. Uh, Craig got his PhD in physics from the University of Birmingham in England and his bachelor's in physics from the University of Canterbury in New Zealand. Um, but he's gonna talk to us today about trauma-informed graduate education. Um, and I'm really looking forward to what he has to say. So Craig, it's all yours. Yeah, well, thank, thank you very much, Bo, and thanks, Matt, and thanks to um, Paradigms and um, American Mass Society. It is certainly humbling um, to be giving a, um, a talk here in the, in the last talk of your, your meeting. Uh, so let me um, share my slides, and then um, I'll give a little bit more formal um, introduction. All right. So as Bo said, yes, the title, what I'm, I'm, I've been working with some colleagues um, uh, about this concept of trauma-informed education. And clearly it's, it's sort of coming out of the pandemic. Um, before I start, let me acknowledge uh, that I, I, I uh, work at a land-grant university. Uh, and so that means that the founding uh, of, of our university um, is certainly um, came about because of the, of the dispossession uh, of lands of the indigenous people in the area. Uh, and so as a graduate dean, um, I have a special responsibility to sort of see what we can do um, to make sure that we create an inclusive environment for all, but in particular, uh, the success of our uh, American Indian graduate students. I have, um, two parts to this talk, um, uh, and, and they are connected, uh, but I'm going to start off um, by describing the results of some of the work that some colleagues and I did um, pretty much from the start of the pandemic. Um, we, we thought it'd be useful to survey uh, uh, graduate students across the country in all disciplines on their experiences um, during the pandemic. Uh, so we were fortunate enough, and I want to acknowledge NSF, uh, we got a rapid grant from, from IGE to support this work. And then my plan is that after I show you that data, we'll have a short break where it will be some QA. Um, and then I'm going to launch into the second part, which is saying, okay, uh, how can we make graduate education um, more humane? Uh, as we sort of emerge from this pandemic, uh, what can we do better um, based on all the things that we've learned, um, but also from some of the things we learned in the, uh, in the survey. How can we perhaps use trauma-informed framework um, to improve the life of our graduate students? So that's the plan. Okay. So let me talk about the, um, uh, uh, the work that we did with the NSF grant. Uh, so we surveyed graduate students across the country. Um, very grateful to graduate dean colleagues around the country who said yes, even in the middle of the, uh, the hectic period at the start of the pandemic, they agreed to be part of the study. Uh, so we recruited 12 institutions. Uh, these institutions varied by research activities. We had uh, doctorate serving institutions, research one universities. We had predominantly masters serving institutions. Um, across the country, different geographic um, and different types of students. We included, uh, we had fortunate to get one HBCU in our study and, uh, and an Hispanic serving institution. Um, we surveyed uh, students from all fields, um, masters, masters uh, doctorates and professional uh, degree students. Uh, we had the survey out in the field um, uh, in June and July of 2020, uh, we got over 4,000 responses. It was about a 7% response rate, which is kind of what you would expect for a national survey. People don't really know 
why they're being particularly asked these questions. Um, we did ask at the end of that survey if they'd like to be involved in a follow-up. I think in June and July 2020, we didn't really have any idea how long the pandemic was going to last. Uh, but in June 21, we decided as a group that it would be useful to send out a, this, basically the same survey to students a year later. So we uh, convinced our IRB that that was a, a sensible modification. So we sent a second survey out um, just to those students that had indicated in the first survey that, that they'd be okay to be followed up with. And we got about 850 responses of that, and that was about a 25% response rate. We also had some qualitative work. Uh, we recruited from that, that same set of uh, students, um, about 56 students to be in focus groups, and we grouped those largely by um, discipline. Uh, and that took place in August 2020. So I will try to be um, clear when I'm talking about different parts of data, where it came from, which, which time frame, because that might um, impact your thinking and questions. All right, so let's start with uh, the mental health aspect. We included uh, four validated um, screening instruments um, that colleagues uh, have developed um, over the years. Uh, the, our mental health um, uh, experts have developed tools that they can use to sort of screen people if they're, um, you know, as, as an early part of their potential diagnosis. So I have to be very clear, this is not a diagnosis of anxiety or depression um, or the top one of PTSD. This is just a screening score. Um, the symbols there are sort of a graphic display of 100% scale uh, with the more bold colors um, being the percentage of students who either in the top row had um, uh, symptoms consistent with uh, post-traumatic stress. Um, the next row is symptoms consistent with high levels of anxiety. The third is depression. And the fourth is sort of low well-being. So what you sort of see is the first three measures uh, our graduate students in June 20 were uh, about third uh, were reporting um, different different characteristics of some mental health struggles. Um, these were correlated. Uh, I recall the correlation had a coefficient of about 0.6 or so. So these were were pretty correlated, but not exactly the same population in those thirds. Um, the 67% gives you an indication that uh, even if a student was not um, fully meeting the screening threshold, uh, they were still not doing great. Right? They were having difficulty sleeping. They, they, they really weren't um, uh, feeling positive about aspects of their life. By June 21, um, there were some subtle changes. Um, the post-traumatic screening uh, symptoms uh, reduced from sort of 32 to 26%. Um, eh, but the, the depression still sort of hovered around the sort of 34%. A quote from a, a student, one of the focus groups, um, might give you a sense of, of some of the things that could be going on. Uh, here's a student who expressed to one of the interviewers that, that they, they were struggling. They, they, they've had some mental health issues over their years by the sense, sounds of this quote. Um, but most of the time they have it under control. Um, but during COVID, it was just very difficult um, to keep their mental health up. The other sort of area of questions we had to sort of set a lot of the stage is, is we asked students um, how worried they were about um, either running out of food or if they had enough uh, food to, um, money to buy food by the end of the month. Um, uh, also similar, we asked them about um, uh, whether they worried about their housing. Uh, and about 25% of students were sort of um, pretty much the same for the two questions, were, were insecure in the, either their food or the housing. The graphic here shows that pie chart of that 25%, um, you know, 7% of the students said they were often worried about food or often worried about their housing, and another 18% said they were sometimes. By June 21, 
that had slightly improved, right? It had improved to the level, especially for the food insecurity from about 20% uh, to 14%. And then for the um, housing and security, it had gone down from about 24% uh, to um, 21%. Okay, um, so there's been a lot of um, papers, um, uh, studies showing that uh, caregiving had an um, uh, 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 outsized effect. Uh, as we all know, we, we've just lived through this pandemic, still living in some parts of the country. Um, for our graduate students, 18% of our respondents said that they had um, uh, significant parenting or caregiving responsibilities. Uh, and then when we asked those that said they had par parenting responsibilities, which was the majority of the people who answered this question, uh, we asked them if they were doing it by themselves uh, or if they had um, help. Uh, about half said, said that they were doing uh, the caring for their children um, most of the time. Uh, another third said that they were splitting time with a partner. The, the one that really surprised us um, was, you know, the 6% the care uh, by another relative. We, we sort of had the assumption that there might be more help around, but I think the reality was the graduate students, um, at least half were single parents um, and, and a third were, were, were co-parents. Here's a quote to give you some illustration of what um, was happening. And again, I think this was just for context. This is a quote from the focus group. So it was sort of late summer 2020. Um, and uh, the student had had experience about trying to be a graduate student and helping uh, their children with school. And doing both at the same time was just really proving to be a challenge. And at this point during the focus group, they were very worried about having to uh, delay their degree to, in order to manage the uh, extra responsibilities they had with their um, child's education. All right, so here's some positive news. I, I know there's a lot of faculty in the room. Um, uh, students responded that their faculty did an amazing job. Right? So on the whole, uh, when we asked students if they got support from their faculty. Um, this is a Likert scale question. Uh, uh, on the left is very unsupportive and on the right is very supportive. Uh, and it was pretty much the same as in, in both years. I've shown the, the June 21 numbers. Um, uh, the faculty uh, were really supportive of their, of their students. Uh, people like me, not so much. So if you look at the uh, mid-upper level management, um, students didn't feel like they were getting support from, uh, from the university. I think part of this, um, you know, uh, it, we got two quotes here. Uh, um, you know, part of this illustrates, I think, some of the things that we need to do better on. First off, um, huge, huge, huge positive from the faculty. I think this quote illustrates that uh, the student really felt like they had um, quite amazing uh, faculty who were supportive uh, and understood the situation and, and, and really gave the students a lot of grace and support. Um, the university, I think, where we need to do better at is, you know, in, in not only our policies, uh, which I think a lot of universities put in place in our policies, but then part of that um, sense of not being supportive you know didn't didn't come through with some of our announcements that we were making fast and furious at that at the beginning of the pandemic and on and um onwards and, and there's there's two things with graduate students they're never quite sure if the communication is is talking about uh when students are used if they're talking about all students or just referring to undergraduates and the second thing is quite often there are policies or announcements made up for for, for staff and employees, and then if a graduate student is teaching, it's not quite clear if that policy or announcement is connected to the graduate student teaching work or the research work. So I think there's a there's a there's a sense the students don't feel supported when communication is unclear. 
We also asked students uh, what their expectations were for completing their degree or whether the pandemic was going to um, cause a delay. Um, in June of 2020, 25% um, answered they expected a delay compared to their pre-pandemic plans um, of six months or longer. Um, that almost doubled by the time we got to June 21. Uh, and so that's not, I don't think, a surprise to anybody. Uh, I, as I said at the start, I don't think e any of us expected the pandemic to last as long as it did. So students were mildly optimistic by June 20, and by June 21, um, you know, almost half of the students expected a six month delay. Career plans also changed. Uh, we asked students if they were uh, how positive they were about their, their careers um, in their fields. And also we asked them about um, if they thought their plans had, had changed from before the pandemic. Um, and by June 21, um, you know, almost 30% of students had changed their career plans. So, so this has caused students to sort of reassess um, what their goals are when they finish their degree. I also want to take you back um, to the summer of 2020, um, and there were a, a um, significant number of Black Lives um, uh, protests, um, Black Lives Matter protests going around the country. Uh, and so our graduate students um, really experienced um, both the pandemic um, and uh, a, a, a lot of um, Concerns about what was happening in the in the in the in the country, especially for African American graduate students. Here's a quote from one of the focus groups, who really, I think, illustrates this. Um, you know, both things going on at the same time, um, and worried in this case mainly about um, uh, the racism they were experiencing and the concerns they had uh, in the outside community. The, the second quote I have, and I'll just give you uh, a pause to let you read this one because it's wordy and I really hesitated to list all of it, but I, but I think it's worthwhile. So I'll let you read it. So I think this quote really does um, say that it's not only the, um, the racism a student might experience outside in the community, but it's also internal in, in, in our universities, in our departments, in our research groups. Um, and this student was experiencing um, both, um, you know, a, a negative environment, but also, a, you know, a supportive environment around the research. And I think this is, uh, compelling for all of us to think through because um, you know I think we have sometimes have this this idea that 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 you know the the research can be sep separated from um, social concerns but both these quotes really show in two ways both in a student's participation in the general community but also a student's participation in our university community um, students you know are, you know, are not in a position to ever separate this. So the student is trying to advance their scholarship, but they're also experiencing um, some racism. This is a very, very difficult challenge for our students. So let me return, if I could, um, to the post-traumatic stress, because this is, of all the results that we've shown publicly or in our articles, this is the one that seems to have gained much more attention than the others. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time on it. Um, so again, I'm going to be very clear, this is not a diagnostic of post-traumatic stress disorder that really requires a uh, diagnostic interview with a trained psychologist. This is a screening instrument that a clinic might use in order to set up such an appointment. Uh, it has 20 questions, it's fully validated. Um, uh, it asks questions about how often in the last uh, 
while if you had disturbing dreams, felt cut, cut off, difficulty going to sleep. And the one which is perhaps most different than other screening instruments is sort of the um, acting uncharacteristically irritable or aggressive. So again, uh, remind you of the, the numbers I showed earlier on about um, a third. Uh, and it just does seem like it may have decreased a little bit in the last year of students uh, would have met the screening threshold. Okay, the next um, slide gives you, um, you know, a layman, in this case, uh, understanding of trauma. I'm gonna give a lot of credit to some of my colleagues, Carter Ellis and Kelly Knight, who have been my the the experts on our grant on trauma uh, and and they were the ones that suggested we use the screening instrument because it's not often used uh, in this context so they have really taught me that trauma is not just this single event or series of events it's it's really is a disruption of our nervous system to being able to regulate how any one of us um, can respond to stress and so trauma is this um, in effect, our nervous system gets changed by the events that we experience and the consequence of those changes is that, is that we have difficulty regulating. So the, the classic sort of, um, and this is one of our, our primal um, nervous systems, uh, is that if there's a, uh, you know, the regulating a stress is, is often described as there's some, you can imagine a threatening event, uh, and our, our very primitive part of our brains, and our neural systems, say, okay, how do we how do we respond to this this immediate threat? Uh, and we can either do the fight, uh, flight, or, or we can sort of shut down and and, and freeze. So it's a really um, ancient part of our neural system. There is a, a, a metaphor that's often used, and, and I'm sure this is so wildly simplified that I'm always hesitant to show this, but it does, it has helped me understand that uh, if your neural system is, is monitoring potential threats in some uh, uh, sort of way of sort of roughly thinking about this, and all of a sudden the neural system is, is firing, uh, and we, um, recognize um, very quickly that there's a threat uh, if there is the um, the various combination of hormones and neural systems that we might reach out and and decide to um, uh, either fight or or, 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 or or get get out of there so that's the fight or flight or uh, depending on how our neural systems respond uh, we could just shut down and freeze and sort of just almost be uh, immobilized by, by, by this situation. And then what I understand for people who have either had multiple experiences of stressful environments or perhaps even one very large event, then this disturbs um, their tolerance, this sort of window of tolerance. And so that means that um, normally uh, there's a lot of things that might happen that doesn't cause the fight or flight or freeze, but if that window, those two solid black lines begins to narrow um, because of either ongoing experiences of stress, then more often you're gonna fight or flight and more often you're gonna freeze. So people may either overreact or underreact to situations they would normally take in stride. All right, so with that in mind, this is perhaps um, uh, some of the things that we're worried about with this post-traumatic stress symptoms, because that may indicate that graduate students, as we emerge out of this pandemic, uh, may have this narrowed win window of tolerance. So this is why I'm particularly worried about this, 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 this measure. Um, this graph here, I know it's small font, and I do apologize for that, but I couldn't figure out a better way of, of getting it to larger font. Um, the horizontal axis in every case is the standardized estimate, so it's a regression analysis, so it's essentially how much a, of a change on the post-traumatic stress measure uh, happens if there is uh, a variation in one of those sort of um, uh, variables. So for students who score highly on 
worrying about food running out, then um, it, that is correlated with a higher score of their PTSS. So the ones at the top are the ones that um, drive high PTSS scores uh, more, uh, and they sort of fit into a couple of categories. It's their basic needs, uh, the food, the housing. Uh, the next sort of group are the ones that are about you know, the timeline to degree or they're worried about their career. And the final sort of groups of, 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 of variables that sort of um, uh, impact the PTSS score are the sort of marginalized identities. Um, Things that protected what we, 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 we sense uh, uh, for PTSS is support from the faculty. Um, so students who scored higher uh, or reported higher support from the faculty uh, were also the same students that reported lower PTSS symptoms. And, and similarly for the, the, the sense that the institutional policies was um, supporting them. So as we move out of the pandemic, I, I am using these sort of, this sort of graph to think about where we can potentially um, make most difference. Um, and it's kind of, it's, it's, it's one of these things that can we reduce the impact of the ones that are on the top of this uh, graph? Um, and can we also increase the support um, that students experience from faculty and from the, the, the university. Uh, I have a couple more slides and then I'm going to have a QA break. I, I wanted to give you some quotes so you had a sense of what the students are describing. Here's a student who is perhaps more in that uh, freeze mode. Um, uh, they're just getting more and more depressed and they're sort of using phrase that they're very much isolated. Here's a student that might be on the other extreme. Uh, they may be overreacting. Um, uh, the student says that they're normally very, very, very calm mannered and compassionate. Uh, and now they're just angry and they feel like they're, they're almost angry all the time. Right? So this student may be um, you know, experiencing these sort of ongoing stresses and that's changing their ability to sort of regulate their reactions. All right, so let me pause. Uh, I'm gonna, after these questions, I'm gonna go into um, some actions that we might do as a community to um, try to Im improve things, but I wanted to give people a, a chance to ask about some of the data. All right, thanks, Craig. Um, so if anybody has a question, please drop it in the Slido. Craig, I have a question while we're waiting for others to maybe pop in. Um, were there any uh, like baseline data on graduate student mental health along these various dimensions prior to COVID for comparative yeah, purposes? Yeah, there were a lot. Um, you know, I think the many of the same measures, especially the anxiety or depression ones, have been used in other population, graduate student populations in, in different times. Um, the post-traumatic stress one, not so much. We haven't been able to find um, a, a prior study. I wish I could right. wave a magic wand and go back <laughs> in time, right? But right. I think the answer to your question is that those typically are in the mid-20s, for those same instruments. Um, and so the 30% is, is a little bit higher than we um, have seen historically. So any sense of like whether, I mean, we sort of all have this sense that, that graduate school is, is, is really hard and can be stressful and potentially even traumatic. Um, any, any notion as to whether I mean, we have a, it looks like COVID made that worse. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you're exactly right. I wouldn't yeah. be surprised as this sort of way of thinking about, um, you know, repeated ongoing stress, um, you know, 
causing all of us, any of us, um, to not function as well. Right? Is a it's been a it's been a mindset change for me personally. I was very more familiar with anxiety and depression. I was much less familiar about this whole idea of how um, uh, our nervous systems, how they normally regulate, and if they get multiple exposures to stress, can lose that regulation. Um, I do think there's a there's an opportunity. You know, I, I resist this idea of return to normal. Right? I think there's an opportunity to really do. Uh, we'll go in the second half of the talk um, to make these things noticeably better for graduate students. Right. Um, and uh, did you have the opportunity to disaggregate the data along various demographic dimensions to see if any any like subgroups were more or less um, affected? Yeah, and, and and I think that's the sort of you know when you know one way to look at some of those uh, standardized estimates. So yes, women reported higher PTSS than men. Um, uh, underrepresented students a little bit higher, um, um, but it was also mitigated um, for underrepresented students who, um, those that reported at the same time that they were getting a lot of support from their advisor. Mm -hmm. And so there was, there was some nuanced um, aspects um, uh, to the underrepresented um, study. But no, uh, women definitely were, were were higher PTSS scores um, than, than 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 men, and unfortunately, I, I have no idea what that was like three years ago. Right. Um, there's one question in the Slido. <clears throat> Excuse me. Were the result were the results of these surveys? Dis oh, that's a question. I think I might have just asked. Were the results of these surveys disaggregated by race? And were in instances of PTSD and depression higher in students of color, especially black students? Yeah, and mildly higher for, I don't know if we, I have to check on the black um, versus um, other ethnicities. Um, we, we did find our underrepresented students, you know, even though I showed you a quote, which was saying that this student was having difficulty in their group, there were, um, a lot of our underrepresented students, students who reported um, a lot of support from, from individuals. Okay. Um, and then another person is just asking if we can get a copy of the report or access to your yeah. slide at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Certainly. Um, uh, I don't know if anybody on the uh, call is one of my um, anonymous reviewers, but we're trying to get it published, and <laughs> and and we're in a few cycles of 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 getting it published. So I really want to get this published so it's out. We have we have some preliminary results up on on uh, our, one of our websites. So I'll make okay. sure the organizers have all those links. Yeah, and they can share them out with all the participants. And one last question. Uh, do you think that other events happening in 2020 could have contributed to the stress as well, disaggregation based on other aspects of gender, sexual identity? Yeah, uh, certainly we, from our focus groups, we, 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 we certainly heard that the, um, the presence of Black Lives Matter, Matter protests and, and that was quite likely contributing. We did not ask that. And the other thing which we heard in the focus groups, we mainly got that disaggregation sort of through the focus groups. We had some international students in the in the focus groups, and I don't know if you remember back that time. There was a lot of law changes, uh, policy changes on visas, and our international students brought that up quite often in the focus groups. So, all, all right, right, if I if I yeah. may, Bo, can I go on? So I don't Absolutely. want to run out of time. Absolutely, suggest that. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Good. Well, thank you, everybody. All right, so I'm I'm uh, forward looking. I suppose that's sort of characteristic of being a graduate dean um, sort of person. So I want to have a conversation with as many people as I can. I certainly don't have all the ideas on how to move forward for graduate education, but I do think uh, there's a there's an opportunity here. Um, I'm going to draw heavily on a framework uh, from. Um, uh, the CDC, though I also note that quite off, quite likely on your campus, you might have um, 
uh, people in your Department of Education or School of Education who have well-developed models for trauma-informed education at the K-12 level. But the CDC has a framework of how to support communities that have uh, perhaps higher risk for trauma after a significant event. Uh, and I think that framework may be applicable to graduate education as we emerge from this. Um, CDC has six aspects. I tend to simplify this down to three. Um, and the first two is sort of, you know, to make sure there's safety, people's basic needs are met, and that there's a high level of trust uh, between all the people involved. The second group uh, is sort of peer support, uh, a sense of collaboration, a sense that, that we're in this together. Um, the third group is sort of, you know, I think the one which catches most people's uh, attention is this idea of empowerment. I can, in this context, can we empower graduate students uh, uh, in their time as a graduate student uh, as we emerge from this pandemic? And the other part of that, that last group is the um, equity and inclusion uh, aspect. So the reason why I wanted to have this opportunity to talk to this group, or I'm appreciative of this opportunity, is I think there's a lot of wonderful, impressive graduate um, innovations around, have been done for many years. Um, I think having a framework like this could potentially help. It could organize uh, our thinking about what do we really most need to prioritize. And it also makes a perhaps a, um, a bit of a decision tree, right? So as faculty and, you know, university admin like me, we're all incredibly busy. So of all this possible menu of things we could do to help our graduate students, um, my hypothesis, and I will admit that it's only a working hypothesis at the moment, is that if we try to do one project in, say, these three areas, right, um, one project in the safety basic needs, a project in the idea of peer support, um, and a project in emp empowerment, you know, that has the potential uh, of making graduate education more humane. So let's um, at least give you a sense of the types of things. Um, there's a long list. Um, I'm very uh, humble. I don't want to um, say that I know of all these things that are going around the country. Um, but in the area of sort of basic needs, uh, I think it's imperative that we really try to find ways to increase stipends. Um, we can find ways to address the food insecurity, the childcare, uh, and also housing needs for our graduate students. I know those are all tough, big items, and I spend a lot of my time as graduate dean worrying about them. Uh, an example, um, uh, you know, University of uh, Virginia really has pulled together the multiple resources around their campus uh, to look at collaboratively trying to help students who are food insecure. They don't only have a single um, uh, food bank, they have a pantry network in multiple places where the students might, might, might be. And they also have a person who helps um, students access community resources. Along the mental health, uh, I would encourage you to find ways to sort of normalize students taking anonymous uh, mental health screenings. Uh, I know I do th this at Montana State, uh, but there are other examples, right? There's one at University of Pittsburgh. More, more, almost all these examples that I'm aware of, they use third party tools that the university contracts with. Um, uh, there's a couple of um, uh, organizations around that basically allow students to select one of these screening tools that I just sort of showed you. Um, the benefit is that then the students get a, a, a perhaps once a semester um, how they're doing, and then it's very confidential. The res results don't go anywhere, um, but at the end there's an, a, an offer um, to meet with, with counselors. On the uh, trust and transparency, um, I, I'm, I'm pretty keen on, on things like this. I know 
many of you must probably do various um, sort of interactions with your graduate students. Um, but I think the more that we can get to know and for graduate students to get to know uh, their faculty in an informal setting, I, I think as we emerge from this pandemic, this is going to be very important. Um, I also, as graduate dean, know that this needs to be a structured event. Right? I'm not certainly advocating for uh, single faculty to meet with single graduate students in informal settings. That's, that's, that's something which I really wouldn't advocate. But for structured group events, either department-wide events, multiple faculty present, present um, either potluck or a picnic or end of, end of year gathering. I think that would be wonderful. I think there's also an opportunity as we're starting to be able to gather together uh, to have a designated space for graduate students to sort of um, meet with faculty on an informal basis. All right, so in the second uh, pair uh, of sort of peer support and collaboration, uh, I think we, we've most probably all seen different initiatives on our campus, or we, you might be already doing it, but I think these are going to be um, doubly important at, um, as we go uh, um, on in the next year or so. Uh, peer mentor programs uh, have the um, uh, you know, huge benefit of having more senior students sort of talk to incoming students, for example. Um, study or writing groups have become really, really, you know, in the last 10 years or so, perhaps even earlier, uh, but structured study groups, uh, structured, structured writing groups, uh, students uh, working together to do outreach projects, um, uh, having social events. So the risk, as I'm saying these and verbalizing them, there's a, there's a sense that, it, that I'm even having as I say these words is that students are busy and can they afford to do these sort of things. My, my pitch is I almost think we can't afford not to do these. Um, you know, I, I do think that this is an important way and these CDC guidelines, the more the community of graduate students can get together, uh, I think the, important, um, the, the, the better off and the more humane our graduate education experience is gonna be. The peer mentoring is perhaps more structured. Uh, the one many of you might be familiar with is one-on-one -on -one mentoring. I am um, pretty excited about peer mentoring circles because it's more scalable. It may be four incoming students for every uh, one or two uh, peer mentors, more senior students. So that may be a more scalable solution, a practical uh, solution for people. Um, we are also trying here at Montana State this idea that if students are encouraged through collaboration to have a joint chapter for in their thesis or, or dissertation. So this last stage, uh, depending on the topic and the field, um, if there is collaborative work that could be going on, can we uh, reflect that and what we expect a student to produce in their dissertation with acknowledgement and um, um, agreement from the committee, et cetera. So I wanted to just talk about the following series of quotes. There's going to be two of them here, uh, and it's more in this idea of um, what the work environment is like. I think Bo mentioned it a little bit, saying that you know, traditionally graduate education has been a hard sort of you know, enterprise. Um, I think there's an opportunity for us to really, really think about um, um, the, the type of hours and the intensity of work uh, and whether that is optimal for graduate student professional development and scholarship development. Here's a quote from a student that really says, look, I, I feel pretty robotic and I'm being asked to do all this work and nobody's paying attention to other aspects of my life. I'll leave this quote up for a bit. Um, uh, it is, uh, from our sur second survey, so it's a little bit later, um, and it's sort of uh, part of this sort of um, national conversation we're having about burnout. But here it's this person is just feeling exhausted uh, and having to continue their research at a high pace. Um, so I think we as 
graduate leaders have an opportunity and I think there's a national discussion. Um, I think the, you know, I think there's all sorts of um, uh, studies that sort of show that um, cognitive performance really starts to drop off if people are tired and overworked. So when you apply that to a research environment or a teaching and learning environment, I, I, I think we'd be um, well, I, th I think I can imagine a, a graduate experience that is quality and productive with a culture that encourages time off and clear expectations um, uh, and boundaries. Um, I know myself, I, uh, this is an exception to be working on Sunday. I really do try to take some time off. Uh, I also use some sort of tracking tools about you know what I'm what I'm doing, and again, it's one of these things. Information is a is a um, a powerful tool. Um, but I think there's an important part of this, which is cultural. Right? So, can we, as academics and outside our research groups and our departments, really set boundaries and an expectation that that our graduate students, in order to do the best quality work, um, need to take some time off and refresh themselves. Um, all right, so I'm just going to move quick, uh, move into the to the last pair uh, of items. Um, uh, and I know this group has got a huge expertise. So I'm, I'm very, um, you know, I just I'm almost most probably talking to people who have more expertise on this than I have. I think it's important as 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 departments in universities that we really do our look at the systemic uh, aspects of our admissions, our qual and comp, uh, comp exams. Uh, Julie Purcell and Casey Miller are some of the national leaders on this and there's a there's a NSF includes grant that's really looking at supporting uh, universities as they go through this process. But I also think there's an interesting um, uh, simultaneous, not only look at the systems, but also to look at um, how we're doing the individuals. Um, I'm part of this by, um, uh, NSF includes grant, and there, there's a lot of focus. I have colleagues who are looking at um, um, this sort of framework to help individual faculty members think about how they could create a more inclusive environment. And it has three aspects. Um, it's the identity aspect, which is uh, increasing your own awareness of self uh, and your students' social and cultural identi identities. The intercultural framework, which is sort of understanding um, the, the, the cultural backgrounds that you have and your students have. And then I think importantly, that's got this aspect of the absolute importance of building one-on-one -on -one connections and trust through relationships. The nice thing about this framework, I think, is that it then can be applied to your research mentoring, your teaching, but also your work with colleagues in your department. So I wanted to end uh, with the idea of empowerment, because I think this has certainly um, been a big part of my life in the last six months as graduate dean, is how could we empower graduate students to take a little bit more control of what's happening in their graduate degree. There's two types of areas. I'm sure there's many, um, but the one that I'm trying to work on at the moment is the idea of having graduate students um, take a little bit more agency in um, this sort of stages of their degree. Right? And I think this might make sense on an annual basis where the student is in charge of an annual meeting with their committee. I know you do these quite often, meetings with committees, but this would be one annual meeting. It'd be a special uh, purpose meeting. And the student is, is quite literally in charge of this meeting. And it's the idea that it's forward looking. What does the student think they need to do to finish their degree? And what is the timeline that they would like to do to finish that degree? Now, certainly that's going to be a joint decision in the end with the committee, um, but that's, I think, an important part that the students should be 
empowered to be able to um, push that agenda. The second one is to redouble down on career. Right? So how can we support our graduate students through their career aspirations? And if they feel like they've got a path forward on their career, that empowers them in some ways to sort of keep on going with their, with their research and their scholarship. All right, so let me uh, uh, wrap up um, I, the second half. Um, uh, I, I do think that this framework um, has, has some nice aspects to it in that it allows us to perhaps prioritize. And my suggestion is that uh, we all try to just take one project in each of these three areas uh, and, and work on those those limited number of projects since we've got limited time. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, the team of people that have been working with me on this grant. Uh, I really have enjoyed and learning from them all. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you, Craig. Can you go back to the previous slide, please? Um, just so that people can see the reference at the end. Thanks. Um, so we have a question in the Slido. Um, first, before we get in, let's just give Craig a round of applause for this really important and thoughtful work. So thank you, Craig. Um, the question in the Slido is, sometimes we don't decide a committee until one and a half years before graduation. So how would this work with having an annual meeting of the committee? Yeah. Um... I think there's there's some good practices emerging of having, um, you know, perhaps um, uh, more informal structures. You know, um, there's a lot of discussion about you know um, a network of mentors. So there might be one advisor, um, a first year advisor. Um, there might be somebody who's supervising the teaching, and or there may be somebody that's. The student is 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 likely to do their research project, even if it's not a formal, right? Um, and so then it could be a, a meeting of those sort of three um, uh, people. So it may not be the formal committee, but it might be those informal mentors. Any more questions? So I was intrigued by uh, the data you showed that students were feeling. Going back to the first part of your talk, um, <clears throat> students were feeling uh, relatively more supported by the faculty that who they're having the most direct contact with. And then sort of yep. the farther out in yep. the institution they got, they were, you know, those were more, potentially more traumatic experiences or, or, or risky less experiences. Less supportive, I would guess. Um, less supportive. Yeah, um, I, uh, okay. Yeah. So the so so my question is, um, sort of how to tie that back into these this sort of recommendations you were just making, like um, this, like paradigms is focused on the role that graduate directors can make, and so that's at the department level. Um, but is there something that can happen at the institution level? Um, to drive the kinds of changes that you're you're advocating for that would have impact on the students' lives within their departments. Yeah, well, certainly I see a big part of my job is 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 where I can making it more possible for faculty to do their work and departments to do their work. Right, so that's that's a good good part of my self vision of what I want trying to achieve as a graduate dean. Um, I, I do think, you know, we can, um, you know, for example, so I have um, working with departments to set up some of these peer mentoring programs. So it's a, it's a nice collaboration between the graduate school and the departments. So clearly the the departments are in the best position to recruit the more senior students. They know which students are empathetic and relatively um, outgoing and, and can, 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 can have these conversations with students. Um, but the graduate school can provide training for these peer mentors. 
right? So, so I think there's a there's a role for graduate schools to work with departments to help us all move forward. Okay. Um, there's a comment in the Slido uh, that says a lot of grad students struggle to get faculty to agree on a timeline for their PhD defense. It yep. seems tough to put a, put that responsibility on students to do this annually. Yep. Yeah. Um, I I'm I'm I have students sitting in my office the whole time. Um, well, sometimes WebEx. Um, but yeah, no, this is a this is a tough ask. Um, but it's also I think from the conversations, um, that's why I'm suggesting this to be in a committee setting, right? Or a group setting, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then it's not as much just a single um, a student sort of having a, um, a conflict with a faculty member about when they should finish. Then it's a discussion and the faculty can say, look, you know, okay, we've, we've you know, since the last year, you know, you've really made great progress on these experiments. It's not finished, but it's finished enough. Um, so those are those are always tough conversations, and I've had those with my own students. Um, but I think there's benefit to having them with a group of faculty rather than just one-on-one. -on -one. Right. And question popped up in the chat: How do you get? the faculty in the room for the meeting, if it's not the responsibility of a faculty member to organize it? Well, then it's the student's responsibility to organize that. Right? So that's what we're doing. Right? So now I will admit that this is a pilot locally, right, to have these annual meetings. Right? Um, there are examples across the country, right? but they're not common. Right? Um, uh, but we're, we're doing it in the spring semester. Faculty is still you know, here. Uh, and and we're, we're piloting this meeting is, is working. So far now, two or three pilot departments, well, it is, uh, what am I, am I hearing? I'm hearing that most of the, the meetings are taking place. I, I doubt if I'll ever get 100%, uh, but the majority of the meetings are taking place. 